Thank you for staying up for so late um, for off-road profiling. And I'll, I will explain what that means. Uh, first, three words about myself. You don't care. Um, a couple of words about Bluevine, though. Um, Bluevine is um, essentially um, uh, an online bank. Um, we work with uh, Python, with Django. Uh, we do uh, machine learning for uh, security audits, for automatic audits, so we can automatically identify uh, which clients we want to lend money to. Uh, and we're hiring. So that's all I had to say about that. So um, let's talk about the events that led us to uh, this moment. Um, I was tasked to answer um, a couple of questions, which were, why does our continuous integration process take so long? And um, the standard way to answer this question is to run a profiler, which I, at first I assumed that anyone would come to this lecture will know what a profiler is, but I was told that to explain what that is, so I'm sorry if I'm being trivial. A profiler is a helper tool. A profiler is something you use not in order to make your code better, but in order to understand where your code isn't good enough. And what it does is it tells you where in your code your CPU spends time. So um, when you run a profiler on your program, you get this uh, something called heat map, which tells you this is a hot zone. You spend a lot of time running this line. This is a cold zone. You, you hardly spend any time there. And there are lots of profilers, uh, and they're pretty much point and click. You, you just run your code through a profiler, and you get this heat map of your code, and everything's great. Um, and the, from the title of this lecture, which was manual profiling, um, you can sort of figure that I'm not talking about those. So the next obvious question is, why would you not use an automatic profiler? And there are several reasons why that is. And it starts with, um, there are various reasons why an automatic profiling, an automatic profiler wouldn't get the job done. My reason was, the process before running a profiler on it took nine hours. And the thing about profilers is they make your code run slower, which you'd think is a strange thing for something that measures how long your code runs, but you really don't care how long it runs usually when you run the profile, you just care about the relative amount it spends at each place. But, um, if it takes nine hours before running a profiler, and after running a profiler, it takes, um, I think the precise number is too long, then, um, then it just doesn't work. You, you can't do multiple iterations trying to change things. So that was my reason, but that's not the only reason why an automatic profiler might not work for you. Um, one, one reason that that might not work for you is because you don't care about the performance of the whole thing. Now, typically, a profiler will give you a heat map that is separated to areas of the code. So that may not be a problem. But sometimes you care about an area of the code only. The, 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 segment, the segregation you're trying to do is not based on which parts of the code you're profiling, but on which part of the program. So you'd care about a certain area of the code, but only when the program is at phase two. And when that happens, uh, an automatic profiler is, will find it more difficult to uh, profile your program, or it will give you an answer, but it will not give you an answer that will be as useful. And typically what you end up doing in those cases is uh, duplicating the code so that you'd run this part and this part and, and that part and that part. And um, I'm here to tell you, if you're going to put ifs into your code, then might as well just put the profiler into your code. And I'll show what that means in a, in a minute. Um, another case uh, where that may, when automatic profiler may not work for you 
is um, if you're if you want to treat a single function differently based on context. And, and I'll, I'll show an example at the end for that, but think that you want to count a certain function towards one bucket if a parameter is one and towards another bucket if a parameter is zero. And again, an automatic profiler doesn't have this level of uh, detail into your program, not because it can't, but because if it tried to do that on all your program, it, it's, the profile data will just be too big. So, how do you do that? Well, you do it yourself, right? It's not that, not that difficult. Um, you import uh, date time and time delta. You take a point capture at the beginning. You run the code. You point, take a capture at the end. And the difference is how long, how, time, how much time has elapsed. Please don't do it like this. Um, why? It, it will work, but uh, if, if you look at the date time, date time returns a very convenient date to print. It, 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 it splits that into year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds, and, and fraction of seconds, which is great if you're trying to receive a phone call. Oh, sorry, um, uh, if, which is great if you're uh, trying to print the result. But um, it's not so great if you're trying to subtract one time point from another. It's just Python is doing too much work in that case. And remember, the point is that we're trying to measure how long your code runs, not how long the profile runs. And Python has a perfectly good function called time. Now, what time does is it returns how much time has elapsed in seconds, floating point, so it has fractions, since the beginning of the epoch. We all know what the epoch is, right? I mean, no, 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 okay. Um, the epoch starts at uh, uh, midnight GMT, January 1st, 1970. Thankfully, that piece of um, trivia is not as important as you might think, because we do not care what time returns. The, the actual value is of no importance to us. The only thing we care about is that the value it, it returns during the beginning. Let's see if that works. Ooh. Uh, the value it returns during the beginning and the value it returns during the end is taken from the same point. And if that's the case, I really don't care where it starts counting from. All I care is that when I subtract one from the other, I get the number of seconds spent in my time, in my code. So just take a snapshot at the beginning, take a snapshot at the end, subtract them. You know how much time has elapsed. Um, great. But um, here's the thing. You may be interested in more than one segment. So no big deal, right? Um, all you have to do is take a snapshot at the beginning. And then when you're trying to switch segments, you do, um, essentially you do this. Um, you take the snapshot at the end, you calculate how much time has elapsed, you accumulate it somewhere, because remember, you may be running this segment more than once, and, and that's fine. I mean, uh, we, we're, we're interesting in uh, uh, segments that run few times for a long time period, but we're also interested in segments that run for a short time over many periods. So we accumulate the number, and then, we switch, we get, the end point is actually the beginning point, and we roll right over to the next segment. Cool. I'm done. Um, okay, um, I'm, I'm not that done. Because there are complications, of course there are. And um, one of the more uh, annoying complications 
is when you place this piece of code in two places, but one of those places calls the other one. So in, in our example, uh, we have code that calls directly or indirectly calls foo. And then we have foo that also measures how long, how much time has elapsed. And what we have is that the point 17 incorporates the time we spent in point 42. Now, if it was simple incorporation, that, that would be fine, but foo may actually be get called from somewhere else, which isn't accounted by point 17, which means that part of the time spent in point 14 too is now at contributing to point 17. And that may be what we want, but then again, it may not. So, yeah, we, we can solve that, right? I mean, what we can do is keep a global. And before everyone shouted at me that, ah, you're using globals! <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I want you to keep this in mind. We're in the research phase. We're, what we're doing here is trying to understand our program better, which means that we don't need this to be particularly good code. It isn't going to be maintained. It isn't going to be checked into your version control. You just edit in order to get some information and then remove it and act on the information you gathered. And when that's the case, yeah, we're using a global. So we're actually using several here. So what I have is this. I am uh, keeping uh, one array which gives the accumulated time we spent in each checkpoint. And then I have another array which tells me how much time we spent at checkpoints that were indirectly called from the checkpoint we're accounting for. Did I completely confuse you or is that just like... Um, so in, in our case, um, we're entering a checkpoint number 17. What we're doing is we're, we're setting active checkpoint, which is a global, to uh, entry number 17 in the nested array. And otherwise, we begin accounting as usual. And then inside foo, or actually at the end of each checkpoint, uh, we say, okay, this is the elapsed time. This is how long we've spent inside the checkpoint. So we uh, uh, enhance the accumulated number. We increase it by the elapsed time. But we also increase the active checkpoint variable by the same amount. What this means is when we, at the end of the program, when we look at the values in accumulated and nested, what we have is accumulated gives us the gross time we spent in that, in each checkpoint. And nested tells us how much time we spent in direct, in directly or indirectly called checkpoints while this checkpoint was active. So if we want the net time, we just subtract the two. Now it's very simple code and I'm sure you can do it yourself, but it, it, it's boilerplate and, 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 and why? Why would you want to do that? So we wrote a library. Now, um, sadly, uh, in order to uh, um, release it, we have to get legal approval. And that means that as of right now, this is not yet made public. I hope it will be released in the next few days. But um, either way, let's, uh, let's have a look at how that works. So I will need to switch. So what we have here is a program that wastes time. But, um, well, everyone has to have purpose. <laughs> However, um, 
It, it does so non-trivially. Uh, we have we, we get we call the function three times with three different parameters, uh, and each parameter has a random component, and it affects not only how long this function calls, but also how many times it calls itself uh, in a recursion. And we want to get a feel for how long it takes to run. I mean, it's it's very easy to get. We just do uh, um, time. And we, we, we know how long it takes. It takes eight seconds, six, fine, random. But we want, to, we want it in more detail. So the first thing we do is uh, we import the library, which is called manprof, because it's a manual profile. Uh, we'll do... Uh, And then we create an instance of manual profile. Now, this was done on purpose because what this means is that you can keep several profiles running at the same time. And they're independent. Each, each one of them has its own globals. You can um, independently uh, profile different aspects of the program and they, they don't have any uh, cross interference. The next thing we do is we need to define the checkpoints we're interested in. What, what do we want to, to measure? And uh, we give them names. Uh, we can do, and, and we, save, we can save the results. So if we want these to be separately accounted for, so let's do CP1 uh, is a, a register checkpoint, and we give it a name. So uh, uh, waste one, and then we can do, um, those will be enough. Um, now, if uh, saving the checkpoints is too complicated, we can also uh, not save the checkpoints and use the names later. So uh, let, let's begin with this. So what we can do is we do, Checkpoint MP, enter checkpoint by ID, CP1. And at the end, we do close, sorry. Uh, we do um, checkpoint close. Now, obviously, we need, want to um, measure these separately. So we can do, just do checkpoint, switch checkpoint to CP2. And we can also do checkpoint, switch checkpoint by name to waste three. When all of that is done, we can just do print the manual profiler. And this looks like this. So we spent 1.8 seconds in waste one, 3.4 seconds in waste two, and uh, 0 0.9 seconds in waste three. The second number is the amount of time we spent in nested checkpoints. Since we don't have nested checkpoints here, then that number is zero. Now, this has a very familiar syntax, which uh, brings up the obvious question of why not use uh, uh, context and the answer is no reason we can use a context. We can do um, uh, with as checkpoint. But I don't think that's a very good idea. And the reason this isn't a very good idea is because 
look at what I did in order to get this into the program. I had to change the indent. I had to change the structure. And when what you do is when you're inserting temporary code, that's error prone. So it's supported. It gives similar results, but um, it's not a recommended way of using. Something you can do, however, is use a decorator. So you can do uh, um, decorator uh, by name and say um, uh, time waster. And this time, we get not only how long we spent in the checkpoint, but also how long we spent in the nested context. Also, this allows me to use the if in order to, to, to profile the function differently based on what the random returned. So I can, uh, for example, say I want to profile separately when random returns numbers that are higher than half versus higher numbers that are lower than half and put them in different buckets. So that's the basics. Are there any questions or do you want to see this in action? Um, go. Um, so you have a report at the end that gives you a profile. Did you ever try to forward it or are you planning in the future to forward it so it can be accessible to uh, um, I, I wasn't planning on that, but um, uh, it's obviously possible and, and it's going to be open source, so uh, patch is welcome. But uh, I, I was planning on uh, uh, YAML and JSON uh, exports so that you can do whatever you want with it. So you can, it, it will be easily machine parsable. Regarding the decorator, wouldn't you be able to to register them automatically based on the arguments? I, I can. Um, I didn't want to do that because not only at the decorator, you say, why, why register them in advance? Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm a, a system programming high performance uh, person. And um, Doing the tests of whether it's already registered and uh, doing that inside the area I'm measuring is counter to my uh, <laughs> to, to, to my my, my uh, professional upbringing. But um, uh, if it's if people are willing to waste the time on it, it, it it's it's obviously an option. Thank you very much.